show for you tonight like the lineup is amazing and these stories are like on the edge of your seat like oh my goodness what is going to happen hilarity I am so excited for you I mean we've got Marsh Shandor here we've got Carson Pinch we've got Hisham Kaladi musical guest Nick McKinley and oh back there and doing the tech we got Connor Lowe Connor are you there bud here I am. How are you? Hi, pal. I'm good. I'm good. How are you? How are you? How was your week? I mean, you got engaged last week. So, like, how'd you top it this week? <laughs> uh, I taught um, comedy to middle schoolers. Oh, nice. Yeah, at, yeah. At uh, 7.45 in the morning. So, that that has to be something, right? You know what? That's, that's the that's best something. time for comedy, though. I would say, you know, 7.45 in the morning, that is... That is Prime comedy time. Yeah, we we've been doing all these mistaken night shows, and <laughs> you know, yeah. morning shows should have been what we were doing the whole time. Yeah, early bird gets the worm. Early bird gets the laugh. Is what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, man, oh. near death experiences. Do you do you, uh, do you have any? You got any of those near death experiences kicking around in that uh, thing called life of yours? See. The thing that happens every week. This is a peek behind the curtain uh, to our to our audience. Um, okay. Is I don't I don't actually know what's going to happen every show, and then you'll you'll be like, so this is the theme this week, and then I'll be like, oh yeah, yeah I got a story, and then you'll you'll ask me during the show, and I'll be like, oh my god, yeah. I totally forgot about this, and what that is this week is I think my first memory and i don't know oh. if it's like a true memory of like or like a remembered memory you know how okay. yeah. where it's like oh i remember this happening but then the actual memory is the memory <laughs> of the memory anyway yeah. for sure my uh my earliest memory is my grandparents my paternal grandparents lived in uh, a condo with a swimming pool so my dad would would take me there and he um he used to be like a lifeguard like a really big swimmer and uh unlike me he had a lot of hair so he had this like long curly hair uh, you know sorry. i don't know why body hair makes me laugh but it just does i have oh, a lot like, myself sorry carry on like head hair so he had this oh. like big curly early 90s mane Whoa. that I would hang on to and he would like s swim me around the pool and then like he... your own personal merman or something yeah 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 cool <laughs> it, it was great and then one time I kind of lost balance and fell off and then Ooh. like time just stopped as I went down and like there's no way that uh, you know I have the perfect memory of what must have been like two or three years old like this has to be kind of me remembering being yeah. told it but right. it was just like time stopped i was like this is it forever i'm at the bottom of the pool 
And then <gasps> I like feel him kind of go down and pick me up for what must have been like five seconds max, but like, you know. Like your I, own personal merman. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Safe from the sea. Ah. So that's, that's the closest I've been to death, I think. Nice. Nice. That and I, I bought a car, so always close to oh, death. Oh, always. Yeah. Oh, man. I um, I was listening to the This American Life story where it talks about the Hadron Collider and basically you send a particle like zooming at this thing and they try and like see if it goes left or if it goes right. But then quantum physics is like, it goes both directions. So basically there's always a parallel universe, which is really something yeah, yeah, you yeah. want to snack on during the oh, uh, pandemic, you know? Yeah, I get it. <laughs> This week, I, uh, we were out for a hike, and I saw this, like, snake off to the side, and it was, like, trying to, like, eat a toad, and I was like, what do I do here, you know? Like, do I, do I just let nature run its course, or do I, like, spare the toad? So I, I intervened, and I, like, shooed and, and moved the toad somewhere else, but it, like, it stuck with me, man, of, like, did I change, like, the butterfly effect? Like, did I change the course of fate? And... And uh, my partner's Hindu too, and then and uh, God Shiva is all about snakes, and I'm like, oh no, like well, I don't want to, I don't want to piss that guy off because he's got a lot of arms, you know. That's he's got a hand in everything. So, yeah. so for this <laughs> this butterfly effect, what do you think yeah. is the like end result? Like you save this toad, know. and then what? And, and then, then this what? toad. Like, like, I don't know, maybe we would be sitting here right now and maybe um, if if I had let this snake consume the toad, maybe I wouldn't have trimmed my bangs. Maybe I'd be wearing a different color. Maybe I would be a slightly different version of myself. And that would just, like... Yeah. I've been wrestling with it for a while. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, but you're swimming also makes me think of my partner has a, she has a, her one like joke that's in Reader's Digest is she, uh, she, he died as he lived pretending he knew how to swim. <laughs> <laughs> that's a and, good one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know what I think of like near death too, I also really think about my partner because she is so smart. She's total babe, very talented, very funny, like, oh, love her so much. Um, but her brain is always like, I can do anything, which is like an incredible quality. But sometimes her body doesn't quite like catch up to that, you know? So like we'll be in Hawaii and she'll be like, I know how to surf. Give me the uh, 11 foot surfboard. I don't want the 12 foot. And then she'll just like eat a lot of ocean. Just eat the ocean. Or, you know, she'll say she knows how to snorkel and then almost drowned or she'll um say that uh she knows how to use a rope swing like like a tarzan like she for sure knows how to do that and then uh this will happen carson can you roll the, or sorry connor can you roll the clip <laughs> <laughs> We do release this as a podcast, so I'd yeah. love it if you explain sure. to the listeners uh, if, so, if, it, if it's possible to put what just happened into for words. Sure. Okay, so um, Nilu very uh, confidently said to me, I'm going to go off this rope swing. And I was like, okay, like, do you know how? And she was like, yeah, yeah, no, I grew up with rope swings in the barn. Like, I'm a barn kid, so I knew. And and she uh, grabbed a hold of the rope itself, and she's about to, like, swing out over this big waterfall. And it's a drop. It's a big drop. And uh, she doesn't choke up on the rope. There's, like, a lot of rope slack. So she essentially jumps and doesn't swing. She just drops after a bit of rock, like, rope burn on her hands i'm sure and then uh that that uh person laughing in the background is me <laughs> but because of this like i used to like always travel like on a whim but now whenever we go anywhere i'm like do you have your epi pen do we have band-aids is there polysporn you know do we have all the emergency numbers that we need it's uh yeah <laughs> near death man <laughs> maybe you'll maybe you'll save her from getting eaten by a snake oh i hope so i want to live in that in that like you know in that universe not the other one we should probably start this show shouldn't we <laughs> take it away oh, take it away oh man
my goodness. Everyone, I am so excited for our first storyteller. Oh, what to say. Marsha Shandor is an incredible powerhouse of a storyteller. She is so inspiring. Uh, so much of this show that you're watching is actually Marsha inspiring me to be a storyteller. Uh, she inspired me to do a whole one-person show, which is so rad. Uh, she has the most beautiful heart and a razor-sharp wit. Please welcome to your screens the incredible Marsha Shandor. Um, at my radio, at my uh, storytelling show, when we do it online, instead of clapping because we can't clap, everybody does jazz hands, and I found myself like jazz handsing everyone, which sounds ruder than I always mean it to be. Anyway, um, happy uh, National Indigenous History Month and happy Pride! I wore rainbows for you today. Um, this morning, the three-year-old dressed herself, did not ask me or my girlfriend um, to grab her clothes for her. She chose them, and she chose all rainbows, and we were like, yes, that is person being raised by two women um, knows in her bones that it's pride. Um, before I tell my story, there's two things that I wanted to say. One is that uh, there is a point in the story where I mention a boyfriend and I did just let you know that I'm queer. And so I know there's a point in the story where like all the straight people listening will be like, wait a second, she just said boyfriend, but earlier she meant a girlfriend. What does this mean? Was she always a lesbian? Did she become a, did the ex-boyfriend know? So I just wanted to like flag that so it doesn't really derail you. Um, bisexual people, we are among you. Um, and the second thing is that I wanted to tell you how stoked I am to be on this particular show. Like I'm obsessed with storytelling. Um, it's what I help people do in my day job now, but this show in particular, like Bad Dog Theatre, have never seen a bad show. I've loved everything I've ever seen at Bad Dog Theatre. Um, Carson Pinch, Carson Pinch, I've never seen him perform, and I finally get to tonight. Same with Nick McKinley, Hisham Kalati. I have had on my show, True Stories Told Live Toronto, a bunch of times, nobody makes me laugh the way that Hisham makes me laugh. All my friends and family know who he is because I have sat them down and made them listen to his comedy album or watch his story. Stories. And Jill Welsh um, told literally my favorite performance of storytelling that I've ever experienced in my whole life. And I'm obsessed with it, so I've seen a lot. But if you haven't ever listened to her on the Risk podcast, it's a story she told at the Great Hall in Toronto. And it's a story I'd seen before, but there's a point without giving anything away, there's a point in the story where there's a reveal. And sitting in that room and experiencing 400 people realize what was about to happen was honestly like not just my favorite ever storytelling experience, but like my one of my favorite ever experiences is ever so um i'm super stoked to be on here i'm also stoked to be on with comedians i uh, i'm not a comedian i'm a storyteller but um but i love comedians and i love stand-up so thank you for having me and thank you for listening it's not just one memory of my granny that i remember the most but 28 years of pressing my face into the cashmere of her sweater, putting my arms around her giant middle, smelling Chanel number no. five mixed with mothballs, and feeling the vibrations throughout my whole body as she would talk or laugh or do her favorite thing, which was to sing. Выходила на берег Катюша, на высокий берег на крутой. And as warm and as soft and as kind as my granny could be, she could be cold and hard and terrifying. If you got on the wrong side of her, everybody I knew was incredibly afraid of her. And sometimes it was quite hard to know what to do not to get in trouble with her because she had some very strange ideas. When I was about 15, she would call my mum. We eventually moved about five doors down the road from from her because I'd grown up. My mum was away a lot when I was a teenager. My dad lived in Russia my whole life. So my granny pretty much um, brought me and my brother up. And we eventually moved just down the road and, and she would call my mum when I was 15 at two in the morning and say, where is Marsha? And my mum would be like, she's at home. She's been at home for hours. And she would say, I understand that Marsha is pregnant. And my mum would say, and your evidence is, and she would say, Marsha was doing homework in the same room 
as boyfriend was mending bicycle. And then when my grandpa died, she started to dissolve very quickly into senile dementia. And I don't think it was through grief. I think it was just because she could, because she didn't really have to hold it together anymore. And I know that for some people, senile dementia, you know, if they're in a place that they don't understand, it can be really frightening, but we were able to keep her at home. We had a series of illegal Russian immigrants who needed a job and we needed someone to speak to her. She spoke four languages, but Russian was the one that she understood the best. And... Um, and I feel like when you have senile dementia, it's a little bit like having a two-year-old in that whatever their immediate um, vicinity is, is their reality. So if everybody's standing around going, oh, how awful, how awful, then you might think, well, this is awful. But if everybody's doing what we were doing, which is that one person would say, quick, everyone, Granny's eating a big lump of butter like it's an ice cream, and the rest of us would pile in and point and laugh at her, then I think it was clear that she'd think, well, something is very funny. It seems to be me. This is going great. And she was very funny. She went through this incredible phrase <laughs> of blending fiction and reality. So you would be watching Jerry Springer with her and she would start telling you his backstory, which she kind of simultaneously was making up on the spot and also clearly like completely believed. So she would say, Marsha, what do you need to understand is that originally this man, he is from Russia, but he moved to America when he was very little boy, which is why he has no trace of an accent. One time we were watching Diagnosis Murder with Dick Van Dyke, um, which if you don't know it, was a daytime TV show uh, about a murder. Dick Van Dyke was a policeman in it. And my granny was asking me all these questions <laughs> that um, clearly like I only would have been able to answer if I had been on Dick Van Dyke's squad. She was very involved with the particular murder. And then she needed to go to the toilet. And because she was... Um, quite frail we instead of having to take her all the way out to where the washroom was we d would just put her on a commode you know one of those chairs where you lift up the flap and and there's a toilet in there and so I I put her on the pot as we used to say and then afterwards I took her off and she'd done a poo and you know I wiped her up and it's kind of you know a bit grim but you do it for love and then <laughs> I got her dressed and sat her back down and and as I was picking up the pot full of poo to go and throw it out she leant over and said Marsha and she pointed she had tiny hands she points this tiny little hand at the bowl and says make sure you do not remove this because they will need to examine it for evidence and so then she started to slow down she stopped taking pleasure in the cat she had this little cat black and white cat Mimi who was terrified of everyone except for her um, who she would call it by the cat's name of, you know, six cats previous. She would say, Boshok, come here. And Mimi would come and jump on her lap. And she stopped taking pleasure in the cat. She stopped taking pleasure in food. You would come in and I'd come in and kiss her and be, granny, granny, granny. And she'd just kind of uh, look up, not really noticing what was going on. And so when my mum called me and said, the doctor's been... He says, if she doesn't go tonight, it'll probably be in the next couple of days. What surprised me was how surprised I was. I remember standing on the phone to my mum at London Bridge Station as she was telling me this news and feeling like the platform was falling away from me. Because this wasn't just the little Mrs. Tiggywinkle granny of the last few years, this was all my grannies. This is the one that I used to sit on her knee when I was four and the one that told me off when I was 14 and the one that I laughed at America's Funniest Home Videos with when I was 24. And I also felt angry. I kind of felt petulant, like a teenager. I felt like, but I don't want her to die. This isn't fair. I, she doesn't have to die. But she was 97. She was going to at some point. So I came home. We had her in a bedroom downstairs and just after I arrived, the Russian priests arrived. And I don't know if you've ever seen Russian Orthodox priests before, but they have these kind of tall pillbox black hats, long black robes, and in this case, long white beards. 
And as soon as they arrived, Mimi, the terrified cat, ran up to them and rubbed herself against their legs. She clearly recognised one of their own. And they came in and they did the last rites. And we prayed and we cried. And we laid down mattresses on the floor of her room. My uncle, Andrew, my mum and I. So that she wouldn't be alone. And we put them down there to go to sleep, except I couldn't sleep. Because I kept thinking, what if she dies and we're not with her? And I knew that it didn't matter in the grand scheme of things, but we'd been there when my grandpa had died. We'd been there when my uncle Boris had died. And I didn't want her to have to do that alone. And so I climbed up into her bed behind her, put one hand on her little bony shoulder that was trembling, my other hand I put around her and she gripped it with her tiny one. And we went to sleep like that for a while. And then I woke up and then my mum woke up and then she woke up. And so we went to give her some water. At this point she was too frail to sit up so the only way to give her water was we had a sponge that we would dip in water and then hold against her mouth. And she hadn't said anything in weeks and she hadn't s said anything that made sense in months. But she said, Spasiba, which means thank you. And then she said, Daragaya, which means my beloved. And then she did something she hadn't done in years. Lying there, she sang a throaty little song. We had a creature, now we saw Kibiri Nakrotoi. And my mum and I laughing and crying, snotty tears, eventually went back to sleep. When we woke up in the morning, we called my brother. He lives in Thailand, and this was Friday. He said, I'm not going to be able to get there till Tuesday. And we said, well, you'll be home for the funeral. The Russian tradition is you keep the body in the house for three days afterwards, so we knew that he would get to see her. We said, we'll kiss her for you. But Friday came and went, and she was still with us. And Saturday came and went, and she was still with us. And Sunday came and went. And the thing was, she was either asleep or unconscious the whole time, so she didn't seem to be in pain. And for the rest of us, it was a little bit like Christmas, because we would like not really bother getting dressed most days and just sit around in our pyjamas reading magazines. People would come over for long lunches and they'd bring food or bring presents. I had one friend bought me a pair of woolly socks. Another friend is a journalist and she's usually like super professional and has never asked for an autograph in her life. But she had been on a radio panel with one of the stars from the um, space sitcom Red Dwarf, which was one of my favorite shows as a kid. And so she got his autograph, I still have it his kisses be strong and Monday came and went and then on Tuesday morning my brother arrived at 10 30 and he went in to see my granny but she hadn't you know acknowledged really that anyone was in the room for a few weeks she hadn't recognized any of us for years but at 11 15 45 minutes later my mom called us back into the room and she said it's time and I don't know if you've ever been there when someone is dying. I'm lucky enough and I feel like it's lucky to have been there three times. And one of the reasons you know it's time is because there's a special particular kind of breathing that they do. So we stood, my mum and me holding one of her tiny hands, my brother and my uncle holding the other tiny hand. And my uncle was praying. And his first language is English. He grew up in England, but he was speaking in Russian because it's the language most familiar to her and the softest of the languages she speaks. Ochinash, Yeji Yishin Danyebisyek. And we look at each other and we're crying and smiling. And we get my uncle out of his prayer. And then suddenly, oh, it was one of the funniest moments of my entire life. And about a minute after that, she finally stopped breathing. And that is how my granny had the best death.
she could have had. Thank you. such a beautiful, beautiful and hilarious story. Um, and how incredible to be, you know, there for the people who were in the room when you came into the world and, and be there when they leave it. It's, oh, Marsha, thank you so much for sharing that with us. It's, uh, yeah, and very funny at the same time. Oh, and yes, uh, hey, bi people exist. <laughs> I'm one too. Uh, if you're looking for more of that incredible work, uh, please check out yesyesmarsha.com. Uh, if you're a storyteller and you're just starting out or a seasoned vet, Marsha's website is so full of all of these useful tools. Uh, she also started this incredible Facebook page called Not Having Your Ish Together, which is just where people go and they talk about the things about them that they don't feel like it makes them have their shit together, you know? So for me, I, I talked about not having my taxes done for, <laughs> the government's not listening, for seven years. But then I got on top of that and I, I actually did it, but I also felt a little bit less alone. I highly recommend Marsha Shandor's full body of work as a hug to your soul and her storytelling show True Stories Told Live is oh, such a feel-good storytelling show and their next show is July 27th so please be sure to check that out um, oh thanks again just oh your grandmother I feel like I was right there I'm all cozy um, our next storyteller is a member of the Second City House Company. Uh, they won a Best of Fest at the Toronto Sketch Fest, you know, way back when we were allowed to um, go outside and then indoors with other people, if you can imagine that. Uh, he makes me laugh so hard and <laughs> once convinced me that it was a really great idea to do an entire scene where we loosely played maybe wolf children, but basically we spent the entire scene licking real maple syrup from a cardboard tree. <laughs> Please welcome to your screen, Carson Finch! <laughs> Hi there! Okay. Yeah, I, d I did those things. Uh, so, uh, when I was 14, which is the age you can first legally get a job, I distinctly remember my dad sitting me down and saying to me, Hey, get a job. So, I did what many of us do in that situation, and I asked my older sister if her job could give me a job. And as great luck would have it, they had a position open. And at 14 years of age, I got my very first job working at a fish and chips restaurant as a chip cutter. I felt like the luckiest kid in Sarnia, Ontario. Now, you might be asking yourself, what's a chip cutter? Well, the job chip cutter is a bit of a misnomer because it's so much more than that. I start by peeling all the potatoes, I cut out all the imperfections, I then cut the potatoes into chips, hence the name chip cutter, and then I put those chips in a big tub of water, and then when the tub is full of said chips, I would wheel that tub through the kitchen up to the front of the restaurant where the fryers were, and this was the entirety of my responsibilities. Now. I have to tell you that at that age, I was this lanky, skinny kid who barely weighed 100 pounds soaking wet, so it was actually quite difficult for me to wheel this giant tub of chips through a busy kitchen. Uh, the tub was heavy, so I had to bend over and get low and push as hard as I could. And it certainly didn't help that while I did this, while I walked by, the salty, much older women who worked the fryers would slap and pinch me right on the butt every single time they did this. Now, looking back, this was definitely super gross and assuredly sexual harassment of a minor, but at the time, I just thought this is what jobs were. Besides, I was making $9 an hour. I was the luckiest kid in Sarnia, Ontario. Also, it was a fish and chips restaurant. One half of the entire operation rested on my shoulders alone. If I didn't deliver on the chips, it would just be a fish restaurant. Also, I know you might be thinking, uh, you know, what about the smell? And it's true, I came home reeking of fish, 
after every shift, but my sense of smell is actually the weakest of all my senses, so personally I actually didn't mind that part. So ultimately I persevered, tried my best, and turned out to be a pretty good chip cutter. So much so that for the same amount of pay, they let me cut the chips and wash the dishes. And I was so good at washing the dishes, they let me cut the chips, wash the dishes, and bust the tables. And then one day the owner of the restaurant took me aside and said to me, how would you like to not work at this restaurant at all? He offered me a job along with my older sister to work on a chip truck he owned by the beach. Now this was the dream. I immediately accepted the offer like I had any choice in the matter. Now, a couple things you might be asking, what exactly is a chip truck? Well, a chip truck is a bit of a misnomer because it's so much more than that, especially in Sarnia, Ontario. Chip trucks are a meeting place. They're an oasis of sustenance in a societal and cultural desert. If you ask a Sarnian what to do in the city, nine times out of 10, they'll tell you to go down to the waterfront to the chip trucks. Now, if this seems not so exciting to you, I once read a list of the top 10 things to do in Sarnia, and I'm not even joking, one of them was go to the bank. Another question you might have is, can you only get chips at a chip truck? Again, bit of a misnomer, because you can get so much more than that. You could get burgers, hot dogs, any other such nonsense, but the order of choice will always be a handheld basket of chips, that you then take to the beach to munch on as you look out on the vast Great Lakes and question every decision you've ever made. Now, not to toot our own horn, but my sister and I were really good at chip truck operations in that people would walk up to the truck, ask us for chips, and we would give them said chips in exchange for money. We felt like kings. Another perk was that I no longer had to wear the old dusty restaurant uniforms. I could wear whatever I wanted. And being a gangly teenage weirdo boy who legitimately struggled with asthma, I of course had just seen Weezer live in concert a couple months previous. So if you saw me working in the chip truck back then, I was probably wearing my beloved Weezer band t-shirt. I was truly in my element. I still only made $9 an hour. Luckiest kid in Sarnia, Ontario. Until one day. My sister drove us to the chip truck, dropped me off to get everything ready as she went to the grocery store to gather supplies for the day. Just like we had done dozens of times before. So. I get in the truck, start cleaning the counters, start up the fryer, I turn on the gas tank to the grill. A, a man arrives at the truck to ask if we have chips ready and I apologize. I, I told him the fryer was still warming up and told him to come back in 20 minutes. He said cool, he left, and I continued to prep the truck. I reach for the trusty barbecue lighter to light the pilot light on the grill and I click the lighter once, no flame. I click the lighter twice. No flame. I click the lighter a third time. Way too much flame. It, in an instant, my body was completely engulfed in fire. If I had time to think, I would have thought, well, this is random. But instead, I just remember fire hitting my body really hard, like a giant fist punching my entire body and face. Uh, I immediately hit the ground and instinctually I know that I need to get to safety. Now this is where my memory gets a little spotty uh, from the trauma of being set on fire you see. So apparently my body launched itself off the truck. I then sprinted across a busy road without looking both ways. I ran down a steep hill comprised entirely of jagged rocks, and I dove into the cooling waters of Lake Huron. I remember the searing pain and dunking myself into the water repeatedly. But I then learned a weird little lesson in all this, and 
if you set yourself on fire and no one's around to see you extinguish yourself in a lake, did it really happen? Turns out not really. And no one knew what had happened. No one saw. So while I was just sitting in the lake, I, I noticed that a man is walking on the nearby pier. And I know that in that moment, I have to get this man's attention and tell him what happened. But what do you say in such a situation? I, I thought for a little while and the best I could come up with was shouting, Hey, I just got burned. And, and that man, being a very nice man, he understood this situation pretty quickly and he ran to a nearby house and called 911. Now, I'm going to guess that the authorities in Sarnia might not have a lot to do because I went from being completely alone sitting in a lake to every fireman, police, and paramedic in the city being there. I was retrieved from the lake and the first responders immediately wanted to cut open my shirt. My beloved Weezer t-shirt. And before I could even respond with, if you want to destroy my sweater, whoa, 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 it was already cut off my body. And that hurt. The burns also hurt, but, but that hurt too. And it was at this point that my sister returned from the grocery store to see our chip truck surrounded by emergency vehicles, flashing lights, and me strapped to a stretcher. And when I saw my sister, that's when I re it really kind of dawned on me that I had just gone through this incredibly harrowing near-death experience that would likely stay with me for the rest of my life. And if that hadn't happened, this would make an amazing prank on my sister. But of course, it was entirely real and she immediately burst into tears. And to this day, I apologize to my sister care for that traumatic image that I'm sure is seared into her memory. Now, while riding in the ambulance, I remember thinking, neat. I had always wanted to ride in one of these, and it was like I was being given the grand tour. They put these tubes in my nose to pump me full of oxygen. I got one of those monitors that you clip onto your finger. I asked the medic how I looked, and he gave me what I'm sure is a very generous 4 out of 10. Even better, when we got to the hospital, they forgot about the oxygen tubes in my nose. So when they went to wheel the stretcher out of the ambulance, I was dragged nose first backwards off the stretcher and I got to hear an amazing thing that you never want to hear from the paramedic who's currently in charge of your well-being when he said the word whoops. Now the hospital was pretty much as you would imagine. My parents arrived breathlessly in a panic, uh, a nurse slathered some medical goop onto my skin, I was given my first hit of legal painkillers. They gave me the good stuff, and it felt divine. It was also at this time in the hospital that I noticed a weird smell that I couldn't quite put my finger on until I realized it was me. More specifically, the smell of my burned hair. But then I remember thinking how cool it was that I was given a shave and a haircut by one of the four elements. You know, let's see wind try to do that. And, and then the doctor told me something that I'll never forget. She called me the luckiest kid in Sarnia, Ontario, because my injuries could have been much, much worse. She said I was particularly fortunate to have closed my eyes and not breathed in during the explosion, along with my crucial vicinity to a lake. Uh, a policeman also came to the hospital to talk to me, and that's how I learned that when I turned on the gas to the truck, the grill's gas valve malfunctioned, uh, allowing an insane amount of gas to start pouring into the truck with me inside. Again, my, my sense of smell, not so great. So I didn't notice propane filling the entire truck before I went to light the grill. And after a few more tests from the doctor, I was then cleared to leave and recover at home. 
Now, not only do firemen, paramedic, and police not have a lot to do in Sarnia, but neither does anyone else. I was easily the biggest news story of the day. Families, family and friends were calling to see if I was okay. Reporters were calling me for quotes. I was the talk of the town, and I'm not gonna lie, I loved every second of it. Also, I was very high. But soon things calmed down, the phone stopped ringing, and I retreated to my basement to lay on a futon, to listen to music. Weezer's Pinkerton, of course, and as I did that, I was overwhelmed by all the help and support I had received that day. I was also very thankful that things didn't turn out much worse. But most of all, I realized that maybe, maybe I wasn't the luckiest kid in Sarnia, Ontario for having that job. Maybe my first job wasn't so great after all. Maybe my first job was actually pretty exploitative and it was abusive and it actually tried to murder me. And as I thought that, I was relieved because I had been given the most amazing opportunity one can be given in their young life because that very next week, with half the hair left on my body, I marched right into work, and I quit that shitty first job. Oh, yeah! <laughs> and wow! <laughs> Oh, so much flame. Uh, oh, so amazing. Please give it up for Carson in the chat. And oh, man, the jobs we work when we're 14 in small town Ontario. Uh, you can follow Carson Pinch on all the social, me social medias at Carson Pinch. And keep an eye out for Carson's new show. It's a, a two-hander with Taylor Davis called Whoops! The Musical, where Carson plays a man who drinks a bottle of blue Curacao, and Taylor Davis plays the ghost who live in the bottle and is now haunting his body. It's coming to a Legion New You in uh, 2022. <laughs> yeah. No, but Carson, uh, yeah, I'm for sure grateful that we live in the universe where you are okay uh, and the universe that you happen to be so close to the lake. Um, speaking of uh, jumping into a body of water, uh, Connor, can you roll that tape again? <laughs> Also, if you are uh, loving this as much as I am, please hit that like button. Uh, it'll help me be like, hey, people, let us keep doing this show. And also, if you've got some spare money or some coins kicking around, Bad Dog is a not-for-profit theater. That's what you're watching right now, Bad Dog Comedy TV. And all of this incredible content is brought to you on this channel, and it is thriving because of your incredible donations. I know, as an artist who used to work at the Second City, which is now a um, big hole in the earth getting ready to be filled with condos, I am so grateful to have this space. And I know so many of us are so grateful to have this space to keep creating content in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so while you're hitting that like or subscribe button or sending your tax deductible donations or just getting another beer, you know, like me, <laughs> we've got a lovely treat for your ears. Folks, once again, Nicholas McKinley. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Nicholas McKinley, here from my uh, father's uh, record room in Sarnia, Ontario. Um, thanks for listening. This song's called uh, Be Fair. It goes like this.
great words and all the last first lines. We drank everything, everything we weren't supposed to. We watched the moon bleed out a thousand times. It was a Tuesday, it was a Tuesday, I remember it well. When we lost touch, it was a Monday, but I've never been the one to count. I burned everything, all the structures you were close to. I keep the ashes in an urn inside of my head. We'll do our best to leave our beds. When our knees touched, it was a Tuesday, it was a Tuesday, I'll remember it well. When we lost touch, it was a Monday, but I've never been the one to count. I just feel like a kind of guitar solo. in your hair You worked hard to be wrong and I worked hard to be fair Thank you Oh yeah! Gosh, I love Nick's music so much um, You can find Nick McKinley playing drums with the Fast Romantics or the doo 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 that gets in my head uh, the little guitar solo uh, yeah, you can find Nick playing drums with the Fast Romantics. They also have a new album out, so oh, do your ears a favor, give that a listen. And they've got a very cool release show happening at the Dakota Tavern on August 20th. But if you like more songs like this, man, check Nick McKinley out on Bandcamp. Uh, your ears will thank you. There's some really great stuff there. Uh, yeah. Uh, and next up, oh, I'm so excited for this story. So excited. So, uh, how, to, how to describe this storyteller? I'd say he's like one part super cool dude and like all parts nice guy. It is the extremely talented and the wildly hilarious Hishem Kaladi. Yeah! <laughs> Hello, this is so nice. This is the uh, first show I've done in a very long time, and although I can't see you all, I assume you all exist out there. Hello, people on the internet. Hello, that people, uh, people that aren't my girlfriend or the pillow I talk to because I've been stuck inside my apartment for a year and a half. It's been Thursday, guys, for a thousand consecutive days. Uh, this is great. I'm very, very excited. Um, so yes, I have a story about uh, what I would consider a series of near-death experiences. Uh, please let me explain. Uh, it was the summer of 2016, and I decided to go on a little road trip. I had a little bit of wanderlust. It had been some, quite some time since I'd left uh, beautiful Toronto for uh, places all around the world, and um, uh, most people don't know this, but I'm very partial to mountains. I, uh, I absolutely love them. I think they're the best geographical, geographical feature ever. Uh, fjords are a very close second, followed by cliffs, which is third. Um, the Grand Canyon is on my bucket list. And uh, I have been uh, to five mountains on four continents in my life, and I'm very proud of it. And I have marked each occasion by peeing at the tallest peak I could potentially get to. Uh, it's just a tradition uh, that started because I drank one too many sodas on the first mountain, and then just carried on to four <laughs> consecutive mountains. And in the summer of 2016, uh, I decided to go uh, to some mountains that I had not been before. I had seen the Rockies, which were quite beautiful, uh, but the one type of mountain I had never seen was sandstone mountains, and the closest ones were in uh, Colorado, specifically Brown Mountain, and I kind of organized myself a little road trip, and I decided to invite uh, my near and dear best friend, uh, John Mostyn, who was a very nice, very sweet, uh, delinquent Scottish man, and uh, he was also really pro 
uh, the mountain, more hiking than peeing on it, but you know, to each of their own. Uh, so we got in our little uh, Hyundai Sonata and we <laughs> booked it towards Colorado and we managed to get there in less than a day. We did some shifts, um, ate some terrible gas station food and managed to make it to beautiful Boulder, Colorado. Um, we slept the night and then we woke up the next morning and we were hell bent on climbing that mountain. That was our only like the possible objective. Uh, and uh, as we were leaving, um, because I am a stoner and I am a guest in the beautiful state of Colorado, I did not know where to source some weed. So I went to the youngest uh, attendant at the front desk, uh, which was a very nice lady. And I very casually asked where I could score some green. And she was very confused. Uh, our lingo does not translate across the border. I sounded like a straight up hoser. Uh, eventually, after a couple minutes, I just said marijuana. Where can I please buy marijuana? Is there either a cook or a, a cleaner or one of the bellboys? And she's like, it's legal in Colorado. You can buy it at dispensaries. And my heart exploded. John and I are huge stoners, and there's nothing better than hiking stoned. I can presume this would be the first time doing it. Uh, so we Google mapped the closest uh, dispensary we could find, which was a, a dispensary called Sticky Icky, no joke, in downtown Boulder. And the coolest thing about this is that it is a former government bunker, okay? Colorado is like a military installation of military installations. They've got army bases left, right, and center. And I guess they had a couple of extras just laying around because, of course, America. Uh, so the dispensary bought one, and they refurbished it into this beautiful boutique dispensary. Uh, but it was still secured <laughs> like a government U.S. Army bunker. Uh, so as we walked in, the gigantic door is a massive, like, bank vault sized steel door that you have to hold up your passports to uh, and, <laughs> and we held up our passports and we kind of got like a hey like, like a buzz and we opened the door and we we walked in and there was this very very stereotypical stoner I'm talking like white guy with dreads and like a Bob Marley t-shirt like level and he asked us to see our passports again and he was like awesome Canada I'm like it's Canada it's your closest neighbor, I, I, international neighbor. I, I don't know how you got this wrong. Uh, but he's like, okay, guys, let me buzz you in. And he pressed a button on his console, and the door behind us leading outside just kind of swoosh shut. And you could hear like a tss as like the actual pressurized steel kicked in. And we're like, oh, okay, that's very safe. I guess you don't want people stealing your marijuana. That's great. And he's like, oh, sorry, wrong button. And he pressed what we, I guess, all presumed was the button to open the entrance, the other bank vault eyes door, uh, <laughs> to let us into the dispensary. But all that did was create an automatic shutdown, and the bank doors uh, uh, that let us into the dispensary also sealed shut. So John and I were trapped in like a six by seven, I guess like large closet sized area, uh, almost in the dark. It was just a single incandescent light bulb above us. And the guy went, oh shoot. Um, Give me a second, let me get my boss. And then he just left and he did not come back for 10 minutes. John and I were very, very panicked. We were very confused as to what was happening. We just assumed we were getting kidnapped. So we tried to get a signal on our phone. Once again, army base. So they had zero bars. John and I were just trapped in an underground bunker in the middle of downtown Boulder, Colorado, all alone. No one knew where we were. Um, if we had died, no one would know. And John and I start to panic, but we're like, you know what? We're reasonable adult men. We Let's just... They, to just be calm, it's not going to get any worse. And then the stoner came out, and <laughs> following him were like seven other stoners, just various like crystal people, just all coming in with varying types of mullets and or dreads. And they were all talking to us. And John and I were very concerned because like he just went to go from one boss to apparently seven of them, and he kept pointing us and then the doors and then the two buttons. And John and I were very confused because it was getting very hot and we were very scared and we didn't see a vent. So we we're just panicking being like, oh my God, do we have a finite amount of oxygen trapped in this tiny little bubble? So we kept knocking on the windows, asking them for information, uh, but he turned off the microphone so we couldn't talk. And I guess we were annoying them. So they closed the curtains on us. So John and I just turned to each other and we're like, okay, we're just gonna die. We're just gonna die right here. And for another subsequent 45 minutes, we were trapped in there for a straight hour it was a sauna. It was like that scene from Uncut Gems where they're trapped in that tiny little room. John and I were shirtless, just sweating buckets. We lost like 10 pounds of water weight. We were absolutely freaking out when finally the curtain opened up and the stoner standing there all by himself goes, okay, 
we're going to try something. And he presses another button. And John and I, our backs were against the security uh, security window. We were at a little just rest of the We're just kind of standing there. And we get up, and we're still facing the wall that's, I guess, as soon as you walk in, it's to your left. And we don't, like, I, I, I stood there for like a good 30 seconds because, like, I don't know if maybe they were pumping weed into the air, but it almost seemed as if it was moving. And John tugged at my shoulder, and he's like, do you see that wall moving? I'm like, okay, so I guess both of us are still? No. The wall to our left when we walked in, this gigantic wood wall, was actually coming towards us. It was like that trash compactor scene from Star Wars. It was literally coming. There was maybe six feet of space, and it was moving very menacingly and very slowly towards us. And John and I were holding each other's hands. We're like, are we going to get squished to this? This was this man's genius idea. This stoned stoner of stoners just pressed a button to squish us to death. I guess what? A trap door would open up beneath us, and we would just, our remains would be flooded to use as fertilizer for whatever weed that were growing underneath us. And John and I just straight up hugged, and he was just like, I love you. I'm like, I love you too. And the wall came up, and it was about maybe a foot away from us. It had literally moved towards us very menacingly for about three minutes, uh, just squishing. And then it started to turn, and all the other stoners popped up around the corner, and they waved us in. Turns out, it was a false wall they had put up, but completely forgot about. We were trapped in that tiny room for an hour, because they forgot one of the walls could come out. Needless to say, John and I were very angry, and in a very kind uh, move of customer service, they gave us all as much marijuana as we could possibly take uh, happily of free charge. And you, got, you know what? I gotta say, that's pretty decent of them. Uh, I, I, I do not think anyone in Toronto would be that uh, accommodating given the circumstances. And they were very polite. They gave us some edibles, they gave us some joints, a vaporizer. They apologized profusely, gave us a bottle of water and a, um, a bottle of fruit punch, John Mawson's favorite. Uh, as a, a token of appreciation, and we left. And you know what? We walked all the way back, we lit a joint, we laughed about how we almost died, and at this point, uh, it was, give or take, around 1231, uh, the middle of a hot, cholera, de uh, 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 hot almost desert-like conditions. We're high in the Alps, the sun is burning us, we're so much closer to it, because we're basically on, uh, uh, on the peak of a mountain uh, to begin with. But John was absolutely adamant about wanting to go and climb the mountain. We had come for the whole purpose of it. We had a bunch of free weed. There was nothing better to, than to do it. And so we completely skipped the hostel. We were drenched, exhausted. We were well supplied. We had a granola bar we were going to split. We had a bottle of water and uh, a bottle of fruit punch and as much weed as we could carry. And we're like, why not? So we Ubered to <laughs> the base of the mountain because we're reasonable and didn't want to walk 40 minutes there on our own. And we ate um, edibles. It was the easiest way uh, um, uh, to consume uh, weed in the safest possible way. Uh, we did not want to uh, be problematic to any of the other hikers that would be there by smoking joints, especially in the rarefied atmosphere. That smell would last forever. So we got a packet of edibles each, and they almost come out like little uh, packets of gum. They had 12 pieces. On the front, it said 50 milligrams. So we're like, okay, you know what? You and I are professional potheads. We can eat 50 milligrams of edibles each. So we popped all 12 pieces and just jammed them in my mouth. He got caramel, I got butterscotch, and we chewed and chewed and chewed and we swallowed and we're like, okay, it'll kick in in about 10 to 20 minutes, let's start hiking. And we started walking and from the base of Brown Mountain uh, to the very top. It's about, give or take, I think about 2,500 feet. It's a really good hike, it's about two hours there. And we thought to ourselves, listen, we can do two hours there, two hours back, we'll be back by 5.36 at the latest, let's have at it. So we start walking up the mountain, we're having a good time. John Mustin's in his absolute element. He is a huge fan of Lord of the Rings. So he was just reenacting uh, The Return of the King. He was Frodo, I was obviously Samwise Gamgee, and we're literally going up to the top of the mountain to throw the, the ring in, in the pit to kill Sauron, and he's having the time of his life. He's whistling the theme song, he's skipping, he's having a great time. Meanwhile, I'm looking for the best place to pee. Uh, I finally came to my sixth mountain, and I was going to uh, Michael Jordan it, six consecutive mountains in eight years, and I was going to pee so hard. I wanted to find the best pee spot to leave my mark on this land. Uh, and so we were about maybe 100, 200 feet up. Uh, and uh, we started realizing that, you know, maybe we had come a little unprepared. I was wearing khakis and running shoes. And John was in tank top and basketball shorts. Neither of us had glasses. Neither of us had a hat. Neither of us had any sunscreen. All we had was a bottle of water and a bottle of fruit punch. 
and there were literally hikers walking by us dressed in full hiking gear. I'm talking matching windbreaker and pants, hiking boots, those ski sticks, and like glasses that had a tube that had the water because they had a backpack full of it. And they're watching us, and they're like, look at these noobs. These guys are going to for sure die on this mountain. But we're like, no, we can do it. We just got to keep at it. We went, we just climbed, and we climbed, and we climbed, and our legs were burning with fire. Both of us felt like we were walking in hot coals, but we kept climbing and climbing and climbing. We didn't almost die in a bunker to give up this far, and we kept climbing, and we kept climbing, and we kept climbing, until finally John, just out of the blue, fell to his knees and started to weep. This is a 40-year-old adult man. He's vegan, a triathlete, and I'm an amazing cook. Not that any of this matters, but just to give you a better image of who this man is, he just started to openly weep. I'm talking like full tears, saw the face of God in the clouds weep. And I come down, I'm like, John, are you okay? We, we, don't, have to, we don't have to hike anymore if you don't want to. And he just grabbed me and whispered, Hisham, we're not strong enough to defeat Sauron. And in a full Scottish accent, that sounds way more romantic and emotional than I could give it justice. And then he just passed out. He spilled his fruit punch everywhere. He just went limp and completely like sheet white. Like, and he's also already a pale man. So this guy was borderline translucent. And here I am, halfway up the mountain, holding what looked like the dead bloodied body of my best friend. And I'm like, listen, I'm a black guy. This is a dead white guy. I'm in America. I know how this documentary starts. I've seen it before. There's nothing that could happen. So I dragged him off the trail, found this tiny little tree, and I kept slapping him in the face, throwing water, trying to get him to wake up. And I can feel a pulse. He's obviously very much alive, but I cannot get him up and aware to save his and my life. So I start panicking, and I'm like, oh my God, what do I do? I don't have any kind of fall back to here. I don't, I don't know anyone to talk to. I, I, and then the first thought that goes through my mind was, call mom. I don't know why. I'm, I'm 34. I, why was my first instinct to call my mother? She's in Ottawa. There's literally nothing she could do. But I panicked and I started dialing her number. But we were so far up, there was no sig uh, cell signal. And I started panicking. I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And all of a sudden, I was overwhelmed by this gigantic warm wave that completely came over me. And the whole world went dark. And the last thing I remember seeing was my phone disconnecting the connection to call my mom, and then I blacked out. I woke up to what was I thought was like maybe 20 or 30 minutes later. It was dark. I'm talking stars out. You can see the Milky Way. There's no light pollution. Dark. Okay, we left hiking at 1. It was now way past nine o'clock and I'm lying completely horizontal just, I'll, I'll just literally straight out and my whole body is wound tight and I start freaking because I, I, I'm trying to I'm, I'm literally trying to let my, like, my arms go out but I cannot stretch out my arms to save my life and my legs are bound together and I keep turning and I, I get enough momentum to turn sideways and beside me wrapped in some weird white cloth was John Mostyn and I kind of like nudge knee humped him awake, just grinding my knee into his hip until he just kind of came to. And he realized he couldn't get out. And he screamed the thing I had been most terrified about, which was, oh my God, we're going to be sex slaves. I don't know why that was his first instant. I don't know why it was my first fear. But I'm like, we're trapped alone. We're tied up in the back of, I guess, a truck, a, 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 a car. I don't know where we are. And all I see is pitch darkness. We're, we're for sure going to get sold into slavery. When all of a sudden, I hear some slight banging, and John and I literally look up, and we see at, at the foot um, uh, of what it, I guess is like the back of a truck bed, a tiny head pop out, and it was an old lady whose face looked like it had been carved from the mountain we had attempted to hike. Okay, She was wearing a cowboy hat and was chewing what I was assuming a piece of straw, and she noticed that we were finally, I guess, awake and coherent, so she popped herself up. And I could see a little glinting sheriff's badge. And she just looks at the two of us. And she holds up in her hand both her passports and says, Boys, do these belong to you? And we're like, yes. And then she puts them back into her pocket and she pulls out the two empty edible packets that we had left in her pockets. And she's like, 
how many of these did you eat? John was like, well, each pack is 50 milligrams, so we just ate them all. And she's like, no. Each piece from the pack is 50 milligrams each. John and I had eaten 600 milligrams of THC. That's a one-to-one -one ratio. That's 600 marijuanas, okay? That's enough to kill a moose. And she just pulled out her straw and just whispered, fucking tourists. And then she got back into her truck and drove us all the way back to her hotel. She unzipped us from the security blankets that they give stranded hikers. And she just said, don't ever hike again. And I haven't. Guys, I've been Hisham. Thank you so much. God bless. Stay safe. Get your second dose. Bye. <laughs>